2 from verse 1, we go all the way to verse 21. Alright? Alright, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. When this first census took place, Quirinus was the governor of Syria. And all went to be fixed, everyone in his own city. And Joseph also went up to Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, and unto the city of David, which is called uh, Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger, because he was no guest, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. <coughs> Yes. yes. Ten. Ten. Verse 10. Mm -hmm. sure. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Verse 11. This day, this very day, in David's town, the Savior was born, Christ the Lord. And this is what will prove it to you. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And, and suddenly there was, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and earth and peace, goodwill toward men. Yes, good. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning that he, concerning that, concerning that he had been told them about his job. And all they that heard his job. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary uh, treasured up all these things and uh, pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. A week later, when the, when the time came for the baby to be circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name which the angel had given him before he, before he had been conceived. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, good news that the angels brought to earth. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that in the darkness, the light shone to bring salvation and deliverance. We thank you, Father, even 2,000 years ago, you remembered us. <coughs> and when you spoke concerning Christ, you spoke concerning our salvation. Lord, we thank you that you did not leave us without help, without a Savior. But you came down to rescue us, to bring us back into fellowship with you. So Lord, we bless you. We thank you that even today we can still celebrate this and we pray, Father, that you help us to walk in that highway of holiness that you have uh, uh, paved for us when you came as a baby boy wrapped up in a manger. I pray, Lord, that you help us to walk in your word, to adhere to your holy and righteous word, that we may find the wisdom that is there and the life and peace and, uh, and salvation that is there. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Sure. So I just want to say a few words about Christmas, all right? 
And then we continue. I'm not gonna take long. Uh, what's the time now? Ten past eight. Uh, yes, ten past eight. Twenty to six. So yes, just a few minutes, and then after that, uh, we get ready to swallow ship. Understand swallow ship? To eat something. Yes, and uh, and uh, swallow ship is. Is the highest level of fellowship, if you know. Uh, when, for instance, the scripture says in the book of John that, I think it's first John, that we are in fellowship with the Father no? and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but as the Messiah comes to take us, to take the church, he is taking us to dine with him at his heavenly table, isn't he? But he also said in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 3 that if you open the door, he comes in so that he may dine with you and you dine with him. Amen. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the scriptures, dining together, having fellowship together, <laughs> having fellowship together is the highest level of fellowship. In fact, uh, <coughs> when, when the apostle Peter was, was warning the brothers to stay away from the corrupt brethren, he told them not even to eat with them. And uh, so it's a gesture that indicates that you have one spirit. So it's always beautiful to know. That's why Jesus was very glad to have the last supper with them. Okay, so from the scripture that we have just read, we see that the angels brought the good news to the shepherds in the, men, uh, in the fields taking care of the sheep in the winter cold. But really, we will not understand the beauty of Christmas until we understand why he came. Uh, because the angels came full of joy and glory. Uh, they came rejoicing. Of course, they didn't go to the temple. They didn't go to the palace. But they went into the desert, if it, so in the wilderness, wherever the shepherds were. To proclaim this good news to the shepherds and when they shared this good news they said today today has been born unto you the Christ the Messiah the Lord in the city of David yeah? and this coming of the Messiah of course for people who were not born in Israel people who are not Israelites like you and me before we came to Christ and for those that are not yet born again uh, Christmas doesn't make sense. That's why they rather chose to to celebrate reindeers and Rudolph with the red nose and uh, what else and the Christmas trees and uh, Christmas. And, and, and the deers with all the and Father Christmas or whoever Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. So for them, they don't really understand the joy of Christmas. That's why they're using all these uh, kind of things to make them celebrate. But it's not about the Rudolph with the rain, Rudolph the reindeer with the red nose. It's not about Santa Claus with his magical whatever thing that doesn't even exist. It's about the, 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 the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? It's not even, yes, Christmas is, is Christ coming to, to earth. is the greatest gift to, to mankind. But it's not about the gifts that we are just getting ready to wrap, to unwrap uh, very shortly. It's not about that. Huh? Uh, we're going to have very good fellowship. But it's not about that kind of uh, fellowship. That's not why he came in the first place. Yeah? And so he does not sum up the mission of Christ on earth. So when Christ came, I think it's very important for us to understand that, uh, to understand the, 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 the conversation that he is, that continues at the coming of the Messiah. Because there's a, there's a, a big conversation that begins in the book of Genesis chapter 1. And it does not end in Luke chapter 2. But it continues, the culmination thereof, the culmination of that conversation is when we are finally together with the Lord forever and ever in that city where there, there will be no sun, no moon, and only the saints and the Lord, their God. Yeah? So that conversation that began in the book of Genesis, uh, if we understand it very well, then the meaning of Christmas changes for us. Uh, because... Uh, we, we, we have very nice lights that we decorate. It's very beautiful. When I was growing up, we didn't have these uh, 
the pine trees. The pine trees. We pine trees in in Namibia. We just we we'll just go and cut a branch from somewhere <laughs> and just plant it in the, in the ground <laughs> and then we decorate it with some lights, you know. I, and I, I remember looking at that tree one time and thinking, what, what is this all about? But that's what it is, just run around uh, because Christmas and New Year were always together so then they were always connected, huh? they've mm -hmm. always been connected, so the joy of Christmas always spills over into the new year and <laughs> everything happening together, you don't really know which one is which. And, but there is a big conversation that comes out in the message of Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, allow me to take you back to the book of Genesis. You know, what happened in the book of Genesis, God created man. It's a very familiar story. Huh? Only if you don't think it's true, but it's a familiar story. Mm -hmm. That the Lord God created man in the garden, yeah? and he gave, then he gave man uh, a very simple command. He said, Eat be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Yeah? And he told him to tend, he says, he put him in the garden to take care of the garden. Mm. Yeah? And then he gave him another command, which was to, he says, you can eat from all trees in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is in the middle of the garden. But this tree was close they were together in the middle of the garden with the tree of life. Yeah? And so, had he also eaten from the tree of life, he would, there would have been no death until today. And nevertheless, he chose to disobey. But before, before you go to the disobedience, you see that the Bible says, God came down in the cool of the day to have fellowship with Adam. Yeah? To speak with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were filled with the glory of God. Yeah, how do you know that? We know that because in the book of uh, Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. That glory fell when Adam fell. Yeah? That glory was taken away and that's why he was all of a sudden feeling empty, naked. Uh, but there, well, while he was still clothed with the, with the glory of God, there was something very powerful that was going on. There was worship there was worship that was going on in the Garden of Eden. There was worship and there was the throne of God also in the Garden. The throne of God was in the Garden. And when Adam was in fellowship with God, he was essentially walking in worship with the Father. He was actually worshiping God the Father every single day of his life, before he fell, before he sinned. Yeah? And that's the reason why God created man. God created you and me that we may worship him that we may serve Him. And His plan, plan, plan A, plan A of God was that if Adam had fulfilled the commands that God had given him, because he was just testing him for a time, to see if he would adhere to the command of the Lord. And if he had adhered to the command of the Lord, then God would do two things. He would finally allow him to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but He would also allow him to eat from the tree of life. And then he would continue in fellowship with God forever without death, without disease, without sickness, without HIV and hypertension and all these things. All these things would not have been had he simply obeyed that wonderful command, that good command of the Lord. But when he disobeyed, then you see also that the Lord kicked him out of the garden and he sent an angel, but not just any angel, he sent the cherubim of glory. Now, if you, if you know something about the cherubim of glory, these cherubim, they're the angels that, that go wherever the throne of God goes. If you look at the book of Ezekiel, for instance, it says that uh, Ezekiel saw the vision of this person who was seated on the throne, and he saw that this throne had wheels, a wheel in a wheel, the, and this wheel had a spirit that was connected with the spirit that was in the cherubim, the cherubim of glory that were beneath the throne of God. So wherever the, the cherubim were going, the wheels were also going. So it's the two had one spirit. They, they never disobey each other. You don't find conflict there. Amen? But, and, and one thing you see also is that whenever the Bible talks about uh, the Father, it says, it says, he that is enthroned above the two cherubim of glory. 
So the father is described in the scripture as he that rides above the two cherubim of glory. Meaning, wherever he goes, wherever the throne of God goes, when he comes from heaven to earth, wherever he decides to go, the cherubim of glory are always with him. And these are very, uh, you could say, the, one, the, the serious angels. <laughs> you know? These are the ones now who behold the face of the father in a dimension like no other angels. These are the ones that are that had the responsibility to guard the glory of God, like uh, Lucifer, who was one of them, although he was in charge of worship. Yeah? And, 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 and there are the cherubims and there are the seraphims. The seraphims, the fiery ones who walk on the hot coals of fire mm -hmm. in heaven, on the altar. Uh, I'll try to keep this short, okay? <laughs> so, so when you see this angel come and block the tree, of, the tree yeah? to come actually in and prevent Adam from entering into the garden, he was essentially, this was essentially the angel that, that came, that, 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 uh, that the cherubim, the cherubim that goes wherever the, the, the throne of God goes, telling you that the throne of God was in the garden. And so Adam was given the task to worship the Lord, that he may pass on this worship to his children and his children's children, and they, as they continue to live forever and ever, the plan was this, that the whole earth, when finally, because the command was to be fulfilled, uh, what is, uh, he said, uh, uh, multiply and be fruitful. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Yeah? So the plan was, after he multiplied and fulfilled whatever, uh, <laughs> multiplied and filled the earth, the whole earth would be filled with the glory of God. But that plan was ruined when Adam sinned. And so when Adam sinned, there was a breach. So now you have sin entered, sickness entered, disease entered, everything. Oh, uh, mental diseases entered, everything, you know. Uh, drunkenness entered, <laughs> everything. Everything, immorality, stealing, cheating, everything entered. And when everything entered, then men began to rebel against the Lord. Yeah? When Adam rebelled against the Lord and sin entered, there also began the dawn of what? Of idol worship. So idol worship continued. But this is not what God meant. So since the fall of Adam, or should I say even before the fall of Adam, God had a plan to restore mankind to that original glory. To restore the worship that Adam was going to lose. And so this plan to restore the worship that Adam lost in the garden, God continued to execute through Noah, as you know. That. Mm -hmm. He wanted to start over with Noah. And he did start over with Noah. And then he decided, I will not destroy men again. But even when he started over with Noah, men still continued in idol worship. Uh, as, as we know, that continues until today. Mm -hmm. Then he decided to restore this worship. He was going to choose a nation called the nation of Israel. And when he chose the nation of Israel, at one point, he also almost destroyed all of them to start over with Moses, the man of God. But Moses entreated him, and he did not destroy the children of Jacob. So, so he chose Noah, then he chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then, throughout this process of redeeming men, of restoring men to the original glory, to the original state, the state that was in the garden, men still could not uh, observe this worship perfectly. Because the plan of God is to restore the worship exactly the way it was in the garden. The perfect worship without anything hindering. Ta but when he restored the worship over and over again, because men did not know anymore how to worship the Lord. For instance, when you come to, the, to, to Abraham, when you come to Abraham, even Abraham was, was in an in the house of idol worship. His father was an idol worshiper. And his grandfather was also an idol worshiper. And his great-grandfather were also idol worshippers. Yeah? So the whole earth was filled with idol worship from Europe to Africa to wherever. The, the, the map was different than it is today. But all over the, the, the whole earth, or wherever men went, there was only idol worship. But this was not God, how, what God wanted. So he decided now to choose one man and through that man, changed the entire globe. Yeah? That's how now his plan came about through Abraham, Isaac, 
Jacob. But when you look at how he dealt with Israel when he restored them from Egyptian worship, from the worship of the Egyptians, to take them to the promised land, you see that something happened that has been missing from earth for a very, very long time. A very historic event happened. And this was when the Lord finally opened the heavens and allowed a man called Moses, a human being, to see the glory of God in heaven and told him to copy exactly the way the worship of God is going on in heaven and to bring it down to the earth and to execute it on the earth that the, that the earth, the people of the earth may worship him just as they worship him in heaven. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So he, for, for the first time, because since Adam fell, men did not know how to worship. They didn't know how the throne of God looked like. They didn't know how, how even to present themselves before him, how to dress before the Lord. They didn't even know how to, you know, how to walk according to his will. So for the first time, for 40 days and 40 nights, he, was, he opened the eyes of Moses and he revealed to him exactly how heaven looks like. The worship of heaven that has been missing on earth. He showed him and he told Moses to replicate. Yeah? And I like to say that, you know, when, when, he, when, 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 when he opened Moses' eyes to see, he did not allow Moses to see the Egyptian worship. He did not show Moses the more of the worship or the worship of the Russians or the worship of the Namibians. He did not show him the worship of the Egyptians or the worship of the Americans. He showed him the worship of heaven, the altar of sacrifice, the garment of the high priest, the lamb of God for sacrifice, the temple everything how it should look like everything was exactly the way they worship in heaven that was beautiful isn't it god finally opened he pulled aside the curtain so that men could see and he says now replicate this worship the way it is in heaven here on earth but they still failed why they failed because the flesh the the the, the, the bible says in the book of romans it says for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. For sin, send his son, uh, for, for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the law, but according to the spirit. So there was a problem. When he gave them the law, there was still a problem. Why? Because this, the flesh was not defeated. Meaning for them to return to that original glory, not only were we, were we to receive the worship, but we needed to be transformed radically. Yeah? The flesh had to die that we may be clothed with that original glory. Amen? But as you could see, they became too familiar with the worship of the Lord. They cheated God in his offerings. They cheated him in his tithes. In fact, at one point, they didn't even take care of the house of God. They started building their own houses and buying their cars and buying their laptops and Xboxes. And then the Lord said, what are you doing? I'm going to punish you, you know. I'm going to make sure that when you get your wages, your whole, your pockets will have deep holes. <laughs> because you're not taking care of my house. You're not worshipping me, you know. So he decided to put holes in their pockets. That means they were losing their wealth because they did not take care of the worship of the Lord. But long story short, because over and over again, he would punish them for sinning. Take them into exile, bring them back. Take them into exile, bring them back. But he decided now that once and for all, he will restore this worship from, you know, from that time onward. So that they, they, they will not have to do this, uh, uh, so that the flesh could be defeated once and for all. That's why now you see the Messiah coming. Because the conversation has been going on from Genesis to Noah, to Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob. They still could, Moses, they still could not return back to that worship. But when you look carefully at what Christ did when he came to restore this worship, he brought the same, he came with the same instruction that Moses came with. He came with the same lamb of God that Moses was sent with. He came with the same garment of high priest, of the high priest. He came with the, what else? The altar of sacrifice. He came with the temple of God that he was, that he transferred to his followers, meaning everything he showed Moses was actually perfect to restore us to righteousness and holiness. But because of sinful flesh, that worship could not be executed perfectly. That's why now the Messiah had to come in. The one now 
whom, uh, unlike the, 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 the lamb that Moses brought, his blood, you see, the, the lamb that Moses brought had to be killed over and over. Now they had to kill a new lamb over and over again for the sins of mankind. But now when he came as the lamb, this time now, when he is killed, that is, that is it. No more killing over and over. That means that his blood now has maximum power. Unlike the sheep that Moses had to sacrifice. Unlike the bulls that Moses had to sacrifice. When he came, Moses, when he brought the high priest, that high priest died. He was replaced by another high priest. Sometimes it was an evil high priest. High priest that desecrated the worship of God. But when Jesus Christ came as the high priest, he came as the high priest who does not die. Meaning, he will never be replaced by a corrupt high priest. Yeah? So he really brought the restoration of worship in the most perfect way it could ever be. Mm -hmm. And to, to rebuild, because Moses brought the temple of God, yeah? the tent of worship, but Christ came as the tent of worship, and he came to transform that will believe those that will believe in him, to transform them into the tent of God's worship. That's why you say now that the temple of God is now with men, yeah? or the temple of God has become men. That's why he says you are God's temple, and you are God's core workers to who are working in God's field, yet you are also his field. So he really brought a very tremendous transformation to kill this flesh and to make sure that he transforms us to the highest degree possible so that we do not turn back to sin again. Because the last enemy to be defeated is death, yeah? And it is sin that brought death. But that's, that death, for it not to have power over us, that sin must be killed. But sin takes an opportunity through the flesh. That flesh now must be killed. That's why Jesus Christ came. So that we could have power, as Romans chapter 8 says, to defeat sin in the flesh. Amen? Yeah. Uh, just read with me as, as we close on. Romans chapter 8 there. Uh, let, let's read that together. It says, uh, I read uh, from, the, from the King James Version. Romans chapter 8 from verse 1 to, to verse 4. Now, so this is why Christ came. Uh, before we read. <coughs> when the Lord gave Moses the law, the law was not sinful. The law was perfect. Huh? The law was not imperfect. It was perfect. It was holy and it was righteous. Amen? Because the law was designed. The law came from heaven. It did not come from Egypt. The law came from heaven. Amen? It did not come from Namibia or from Australia. It came from heaven, meaning it had only the instruction for living according to the heavenly life. Amen? Uh, uh, but the problem was that the flesh was not transformed when the law came first. But the righteousness that the, that, that the Lord demanded, that righteousness was a heavenly righteousness. And it was not a, 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 a righteousness from Namibia or from America. <laughs> it was the righteousness of heaven that we all need to achieve, to attain. But the problem is, because of this flesh, we could not attain it. But now look at what he said. Uh, verse 1. There, there is therefore now no, more con no condemnation uh, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Meaning, he came to allow us, after transforming us and defeating the flesh, I mean the sin in the flesh, and then killing the flesh, he came now to allow us to achieve the righteousness or to receive the righteousness that the Lord demanded all along. It was not a different righteousness. It is the same righteousness that Moses came to command them to achieve, to, to attain, to receive, I mean to, 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 to cultivate in their lives. Yeah? That same righteousness, that righteousness of heaven, it's not a different righteousness. It's the same righteousness. He says that the righteousness of the law, the very one that the Lord demanded, might be fulfilled in us at last. Because it is the only righteousness that heaven demands. And without that righteousness, there is no heaven. Without that righteousness, no fellowship with the Father. Without that righteousness, 
Sin will still continue conquering and defeating you. Without that righteousness, you will never be transformed into the image of the Father. Because it is that righteousness which is the mirror image of the Father. Amen. Alright, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I should wrap up, wrap up this way. That when he now came to restore the worship, a day is still coming when those now that have been fully transformed by this renewal, huh? by this sacrifice, this perfect sacrifice, those that have finally been transformed into that perfect righteousness will finally enter into the glory of the Father and worship Him as He meant in the garden. Huh? That's why you see that He's going to come back with them. He's going to come back with us. And then He will come back to Jerusalem for a thousand years. And then after that, the second judgment, I mean the second resurrection of the dead who are not righteous. And then after that, the judgment, the final judgment. And then after the final judgment, then you see the new Jerusalem. And then you see the new heaven and the new earth. And you see that, he says, and in that new Jerusalem, nothing unrighteous enters. Meaning, nothing that is of the flesh enters. Meaning, nothing that is of sin enters. Everything that refused <laughs> to obey the, the law of God, to obey the, the, the sacrifice of Christ, will face the eternal judgment. But for those that have finally been transformed by this sacrifice that we are celebrating today, they will finally then enter into that glory and worship Him just as He meant in the beginning. Amen. Amen. So the Messiah is coming and I think that's the most important message now. Because the, He came, He sacrificed, He gave Himself up and now He's coming back. <coughs> so for now, there's, there's, no, there's no better duty for us than to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Messiah. Because if He's coming back in the next hour, in the next two hours, we don't want to, to be found not ready because for 2,000 years the sacrifice was already <laughs> was, was already working. The blood was already flowing for those 2,000 years. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. One time, I think in 2015, yeah, it, like, we were talking about this heaven and after now, you, after you went to go to heaven, this other colleague asked me, so is in heaven, are you... Uh, the only sin, yeah, yeah, I said yes, the only sin. Mm -hmm. So you won't think about it or you just don't do it. Then I'm saying, then I'm like, no, you won't think about it because you you, you have that mind of just doing what's right and mm -hmm. and after the righteousness and holiness of God. He said, ah, I think that, then that's mind controlling. <laughs> because, because God is making you think the way he wants to think. Then I said, no, it just something you desire, something you just want, but it's not that which is bad. Because his mindset is like, and then I said, no, actually, if there was mind controlling, then Jesus, uh, then the devil would not have sinned. Because he sinned while he was in heaven. Because if God wants really to just control people's mind, then there won't be even need for preaching or need for, for convincing people to, to understand his goodness. And, and, and actually, well, that, that person that has problem with control is, is just being hypocritical, really. Because in reality, in reality, if you if you continue reading the chapter we just read, verse five, can you read verse five? Those who live as their human nature tells them to have their minds controlled, have their minds controlled by what human nature wants. Those who live as the Spirit tells them uh, to uh, have their minds controlled. Mm. Have their minds controlled mm. by what the Spirit wants. Yes, you see, we are all controlled. <laughs> <laughs> it just depends on who's controlling them. <laughs> you see, yeah, we are all controlled. It just depends on who's controlling you. Whether it's the flesh or the Spirit. And we know that the flesh leads to death. Because what he wants, he wants freedom, but it's not freedom. Yeah. He wants to rebel against the Lord. Yeah. And that's already controlled yeah, by the he, flesh. He thinks it's not free. <laughs> yeah. If, 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 if somebody has to tell him what to do, or mm -hmm. somebody... He... Because, because we all... We all the, 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 there's another principle in the scripture. It says, you are a servant of whomever you choose to obey. To save. Mm -hmm. So if you submit to the law of God, the, the, the Holy Spirit will be controlling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And you will do it joyfully. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. He gives you joy. Love, joy, peace, patience. There is nothing forceful whenever the Lord Jesus Christ is in charge. 
да? But whenever the, the, the devil is in jail, ой, Lord have mercy. And then that's the, I think that's the one of the greatest deception because human beings today they think we are free. You're not really free. They say I'm free to do whatever I want, and what they really mean is I'm free to sin. Because if they are really free to do whatever they want, which is good, they will obey the Lord. Because if you if your eyes are really open, you realize that. You know, spending money on alcohol, spending money on pornography, spending money on this, spending money on you know worldly things, and just oh, you just live for holidays and you just live for parties. You know, you realize that it's not just about making money, yeah, yeah? Because even money flies away. <laughs> Bible says even money grows wings and flies away, yeah. So yeah, every one of us is controlled, but control. So in, in that sense, for us to look at control as bad. It is really the rebellious ones who are rebe who who don't want the control of the Lord, but they don't know that you are a slave of whomever you choose to obey. And every day we are obeying someone. Every day we are obeying someone. Every day you are obeying somebody <laughs> in whatever area of your life, whether it's in what you study or in what you eat, in what you dress, what you watch, what you drink. There is someone controlling your, your decisions. Yeah? That is the person that you have decided to obey. Yeah? Like you came here, we told you to take off your shoes. <laughs> you <obeyed. laughs> Our parents told us to take off our shoes. <laughs> no. yeah, that's true. And it's nothing bad. Is it bad? No. You like that this place is clean, isn't it? Yeah. You don't. You don't want to walk in that on that in that uh, wooden place there with your barefoot, and and you're wondering what is up with these square this? Their their floor is so dirty. <laughs> no. It's good. Or, or, or we, we, we ask you guys to bring some gifts. It's nothing good. That much it's time to bring it. It's not it bad. It's not bad to be told what to do. <laughs> Just the person who is telling you what to do. Yes. And what he is telling you to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I don't know if anybody wants to say something. I'm done. You can probably continue talking the whole evening. Just kind of like... Uh, I'm done. Casually. Sure. I have want to say something, want to ask a question, want to ask some quiz. Uh, it's now 8.38 and there's still a lot of food waiting for us. Very, very delicious food, but let me not take your mind off of this one. Yes, we can talk, as Anna suggested. Continue talking. I can continue talking for three more hours. I can do that. <laughs> Practically, yes. <laughs> I will continue for speaking for three hours. But we can't find that. Yep. Are you okay? Yes. Uh, Actually, you can sit here now because I'm going to warm no, some food. Yes, so we can get some food. Maybe. Uh, I need to warm it first. So. All right. We'll try. <laughs>